Well, thank you very much, Julianne. Um, you're welcome, everybody. Uh, the state of South Australia, as we've just heard, is at something of an economic tipping point. We have taken some hefty economic knocks recently, and there is some despondency out there arising from those knocks. But there's also an air of opportunity that from austerity, opportunity arises. So what we're here to talk about today is what is the way forward? How can we actually capitalise on that air of opportunity that's around? Now, I want to start that discussion in just a moment. I should add that because this is an event run through our, our wonderful facility here in, uh, in Adelaide uh, and uh, in conjunction with CEDA, that we are live streaming this. Uh, if you are unfortunately remote from gorgeous downtown Adelaide and you wish to join in the discussions, please do so via Twitter using the hashtag ShapingSA uh, and also via the chat roll on the CEDA live stream. All those at home know what I'm talking about. Everyone in the audience is looking at me like I've lost something. Um, but I would uh, mention to the uh, audience here, um, please uh, have your mobile phones switched to silent and tweet vigorously throughout this event because it's a good way to be able to uh, get that conversation, that discussion going. If you do tweet, please use the hashtag ShapingSA. So to get the discussion started, I'd like to quickly go around the, the distinguished panel that we have here on the question of uh, optimism through opportunity or doom and gloom business as usual. Joanne, where do we sit in this fair state? I think um, I'd like to say optimism and I think there is a good sense of optimism and I certainly noticed that moving back from interstate after a period of being away from Adelaide. I do think we can get caught up, though, in thinking that we don't have opportunities, when if we look at some of the really successful business stories that have actually grown out of this state, um, you'd have to say this is a state where you can actually set global businesses up and they can flourish. David? Uh, well, an upper or a downer? Uh, I'm on an upper. I'm usually on an upper. Um, <laughs> I suppose I wouldn't be sitting here if I wasn't an optimist. Um, migration is the theme of today's uh, discussions, right? And you have a migrant, a migrant, a migrant over there, many migrants in the room. Um, and I don't, think, uh, I don't think we'd be here if we weren't upbeat. Um, the opportunities that I saw from the far side of the planet stand out pretty large. I mean, this is a small state with an innovative track record in history. Um, it's got I'm, I'm astounded by how many small and medium enterprises there are. I didn't really appreciate it until I was on the ground. And when you think about that, that means there's a creativity and, and, and an entrepreneurial culture already in South Australia. So the challenge then for us is how do we grow it? How do we actually scale it? Um, and when I look at the state and I look at the institutions that we lead, that the people in this room lead, um, I don't get a sense of doom and gloom. I know that we're going to have a hiccup. And I'm, I'm, it's not a great term to describe what's going to happen, I'm hoping. But it's not something that hasn't happened in other places. And it's not something that other places haven't recovered from and grown from. So I think you know we, we, we shouldn't look at it as an opportunity, but we shouldn't look at it as, being, as the end of the world. Bernard, do you see pluses or minuses? Well, I don't think you can be a resident of Australia and not uh, see um, uh, look to the future optimistically. Uh, we are the only nation on the planet to claim the resources of an entire continent. There's only 23 million people. And we claim the entire sovereignty of the entire continent and offshore reserves, including the Gorgon Gas Project for $50 billion of 40 kilometres off the coast of Caratha. All of that is ours for 23 million people. The Americans don't claim anything like that. We also have a suspended claim to one third of the Antarctic continent as well. Uh, we have a very, uh, we have a, uh, an extraordinary uh, resource base to share amongst 23 million people. And within that continent, you have one and a half million people claiming the resources of the entire state of South Australia. Uh, in many ways, South Australia is the Australia uh, of the Australian continent in terms of the scale of the population base versus the, um, the territory, the sovereignty that is of a birth rate, uh, South Australians. It's a question of converting that, of capitalising that, leveraging that, I suppose. If you wanted to be in the best place in the world over the next 10 years, I would choose Australia. 
And I don't know why you would not also choose South Australia. I don't know what those opportunities are. I don't know how we're going to leverage that. But if you look at the skilled population base versus the resources that are open to this state, then put those two together. There has got to be opportunity uh, in this place going forward. Well, uh, the discussion today will actually revolve around uh, the, the workforce that's required to capitalise on those opportunities uh, and how we go about getting it. But first of all, David, what does that skilled workforce look like? What attributes, what qualities are we looking for? Um, I suppose I'll, I'll echo Hans' opening comments. We, we can't predict, predict, uh, predict the future, right? So, so our futurology sort of annoys me um, because it, invariably it, it, it turns out to be wrong, right? Um, if you look at the, uh, the top 10 US-based growth industries, nine of the top 10 are in areas which link information technology or science, engineering, mathematics, right? That, that's, that's, that's where, where the future of the US growth is. If you look at Australian job opportunities in the next 10 years, there are more which lean towards health and uh, accountancy and management than there are around ICT, engineering, and mathematics. There's a, there's a stratification. Right? Now, if I look at this state and think about the skills that we need to, to actually develop businesses and to go from, um, to, to take agrarian and to take manufacturing into services and really high-end value, I think you need to have um, an innovation quotient, an IQ in the state which is higher than it currently is, a creativity quotient which is higher than it currently is, and um, skill sets in the homegrown students, uh, graduates, workforce, and those we bring in, where they can join dots, um, because I think the convergence of our industries is going to be really important. How we take engineering skills and bring them into food, how we take IT skills and bring them into mining. Um, the mines of the future, if you look to what Rio Tinto did, they're, they're pretty automated. Um, the value that's in the ground has to be unlocked by the value that's in our heads. So I think we need to move towards a, 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 a well, smart economy is an overused phrase, right? But, but clever people doing clever things that bring skills together to leverage what we have. Not to create something new, but to leverage what we have. So, uh, Bernard, would you agree that uh, the workforce we've got, we, we need something smarter, a different skill set than what's already in, in existence here? Well, well I think, uh, of course, we need to be um, uh, better <coughs> skilled, uh, better skilled, if you like, uh, in the Edit. future. Um, <laughs> But, but I, think that, uh, I think there's another dimension to this, uh, and I would look to cultural shift. Uh, I understand expertise in David's expertise in, in you know, the, the, we need mathematical skills, we need these skills, that's fine, that's, that's someone else's expertise. What I suggest is that what we all, at an Australia-wide level, as well as in the South Australia level, uh, is uh, look towards creativity and flexibility and fluidity. Mm. We do not know the jobs of the future, but what I do know, what I can predict with utter confidence, and you might rely upon this advice, and that is that uh, a Gen Y today at the age of 23 will have four, five, six, seven, eight, ten jobs in the future, and that the jobs in the businesses in their 40s will not even exist. Those companies will not exist in their 20s. So the skill set is you need to be clever, you need to be mathematical skills, whatever that is, but you also need to be able to form relationships. You need to be fluid. If you're the sort of, sort of person that does not like change, uh, then the future workforce is not for you. This business no longer works. You need to take your skill set and apply them to another enterprise, in another location, working to a different format, working in different relationships. I can walk into it, not me, but I can walk into an office and I can form a relationship with these people, producing output to that. That is, I think, the, cri the, the critical skill of the future. Fluid, flexible, mobile, pleasant, agreeable, social, collaborative, and then the technical skills. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'll leave that to others what they are. But those social skills is what I see uh, as being required. And the people that would be wrong-footed are saying, well, you know, I've been trained in this. I've been doing it for 20 years. And the problem is with the organisation. And if the only the organisation had have done this, then my pathway right through to retirement is assured. I am entitled to that. If that's the way you think, then you will not survive the next 10 years, let alone the next 50 years. I think Australia, South Australia, uh, needs to actually get on board with the way in which the workforce, the culture of the workforce is changing. All right, so uh, we've identified the type of workforce that we require. 
let's delve into how we go about getting that. And the first opportunity to achieve that workforce, and Joanne, I'm coming to you here, is, is organically, uh, homegrown. Let's uh, get the, uh, the, the, the young people of South Australia to skill up and stay here. Is that as easy as I made it sound? I think we are absolutely blessed with some fantastic universities here, um, which certainly we leverage. Uh, we, we have employed about 200 graduates, I think, over the past um, four or five years. And um, that, that is homegrown talent. Uh, the challenge is keeping them here. And, uh, and that relies on um, industry flourishing. It relies on um, companies uh, making investments and taking the right sort of decisions and then providing ongoing opportunities for people and marketing those opportunities as well. Our, um, I have no doubt that if we didn't take the decision at Santos to employ so many graduates, for instance, uh, back in um, you know, five or six years ago, we would have been um, hard pressed to deliver the project that we are delivering next year up in Brisbane. Queensland. I mean, part of that discussion, particularly around homegrown talent, um, is that there are going to be different requirements for more skilled people in different sectors. And for instance, in the food and agricultural sector, um, the logical pool that's always been there has been family operated uh, businesses, family operated phone, uh, farms. It's the, the, the next generation that comes through. So in that particular case, David, what we're looking at is giving those people the skills to carry on that tradition. Yeah, um, it's a yes and no answer, Paul. Right? Uh, I think in certain cases, people are good at what they're good at, right? Um, and you can layer in resilience and all the extra skills that, that, that Bernard talked about. I mean, that's really important. I think in other cases, you need to bring people who have got complementary skills together. And, um, and, and how we get that, I suppose, knowledge transfer, as I said, between industries is going to be very important. Um, one of the things that concerns me about a small uh, enterprise state is that it's, it's the dispersal of small, and, and that you don't achieve the critical mass. You don't achieve the, 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 the sum of the parts. So how we can get people working together cooperatively is going to be very important, which is about business-to-business -business relationships. And that may not necessarily be the person who's adept at, uh, at, at running the farm in terms of the, the agriculture piece. It might be the business manager that we need to bring in to run a group of farms with, with people collaboratively. So it's about matching skills up uh, as well as learning in new skills, I think. Uh, Bernard, is there a, a role for government here to make life more attractive for um, resident South Australians to skill up and stay on? Um, yes, there is, um, but I would suggest that that, again, is traditional type of thinking. You know, what is the government? What, what are you going to do about it? I, don't, I never like that. It's, uh, it's outsourcing it. I'm OK. It's the government that's wrong, and what do they need to do? We need to apply pressure. I want to really challenge South Australians and Australians generally and say, is there something that every individual can do? Uh, I'm not a resident of South Australia. I've been travelling here monthly for 10 years or so. About 10 years ago, I was here at a conference and I was speaking to the movers and shakers <laughs> of, uh, of Adelaide and I was saying, what a fantastic place this is, and I agree, it's absolutely wonderful. Later on in the day, I was chatting with them about where their son or their daughter was and they're in London or New York or Shanghai or Mumbai and they were showing off to each other in a very subtle way about, oh, my son's in London, oh, yes, my daughter's in New York. Um, I am so successful as a parent, I have catapulted them <laughs> into a global business centre, if you like. I want to see a shift in thinking. I actually see it as quite a colonial view, that there is a sophisticated place over there, and we are a colonial outpost. And I measure myself as an Adelaidean, as an Australian. I've seen it in Auckland. I see it in provincial cities around Australia. People not taking pride in their son or daughter investing their youth, their energy, their dynamism, their best years into this city, this state, that to me is a vote of confidence. And I would like to see a broader 
shift in culture. I'd like to see the Adelaide Advertiser. I'd like to see the local television stations starting to showcase the best and brightest. Here is a 28-year-old out at Salisbury who started with nothing and who is now a builder employing three apprentices. I would rather showcase that person in a spread in the middle pages of the Adelaide Advertiser than showcasing the, which expat from Adelaide is now making it big in Sydney or in Los Angeles. You're sending the wrong messages. We only value you, we only recognise you, we only think you've made it if you leave Adelaide. I want to turn that around and say, I want to showcase the best and brightest who invest their youth, their energy, their best years into this state. I think there needs to be a culture shift. And then go to the government and say, you know, what have we got to support that? We're doing our bit, government do your bit. And I, it's not just Adelaide, uh, it's, it's Melbournians do it, Sydney siders do it, my son, my daughter in London, New York, whatever it is, it's quite an Australian uh, colonial view of the world and I think we need to shift it. Can I actually challenge you on that? Because <laughs> yeah, look, I, I have been struck since I've moved to South Australia, the very high proportion of uh, people that they're born here, they grow up here, they go to university interstate, they go internationally uh, to start their careers in a wide variety of endeavours. When they want to have a family, they come back to South Australia and they bring with them the skills that they've acquired interstate and internationally. And so therefore, it's probably a really good thing that we export them, providing they come back. I couldn't agree more. The model that I was suggesting of a 28-year-old is a model of someone who goes through high school, perhaps, and, and, and builds a local business. That's one model that should be celebrated. There is another model, which is you go through uni, SA, Bright, you go to London, and you work for whatever, and you bring back ideas, thinking, relationships, people, a partner, perhaps, and you want the best quality of life, uh, you come back to Adelaide. I'd be celebrating the 28-year-old builder out of Salisbury, and I would be also celebrating and showcasing the 32-year-old that comes back from London, Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, who wants to invest 32 to 52, those years, in my city, my state. So I think there are two, there are two pathways. Yeah. One is the local, and one is the expat. Who comes back? Who comes back? Who has voted with their feet to invest their next and best 20 years in this state? A logical follow-on from that is, uh, you know, if we have the observation that a lot of South Australians go interstate for their education, uh, higher education, um, how do we turn that around so that we attract more people from interstate for higher education, for skilling up and, uh, and getting involved in South Australian industries? David, I'm looking at you here. Um, <laughs> Dispel the myth. I don't. I don't think actually a high proportion of, of our school leavers leave. Um, uh, they actually tend to be quite homebirds. They leave after graduation, and the diaspora repatriation has to be part of our strategy. Um, in fact, I, I, I like you, Paul. I, I've I've met a lot of people who have gone off, gone be, been quite successful, and come back to raise the families here. So there's a generation of of, of return uh, export. Um, I suppose uh, expertise. <coughs> In bringing the, uh, I mean, it, the Australian system, looking at it from a European perspective, right, is, is quite unusual. Um, Australians invest an awful lot of time in gap years where they travel the world and they won't go interstate for education. Um, and it's a, it's a cloistered sense of perspective that that, that engenders then in, in a society. It's, it, it's slightly worrying. I think the, um, I won't mention the budget, but the budget uh, <laughs> is, is probably going to influence this because uh, I, with an open market economy for higher education, we're going to see differentiation in the sectors. And we've already tried to differentiate ourselves locally in the state level, but that just moves people between the three institutions that we have here. Um, when, you, when you look nationally, um, greater, dis greater differentiation, greater uh, ability to actually market attributes of the, of the universities, uh, you know, that you're actually more likely to be employed because you've gone to University X, or your graduate satisfaction is because you've gone to University Y, you will see a certain subset of mobility, uh, I think, interstate in that fashion. Um, but it's a slow, slow boil um, because the tradition of interstate education is actually not here, um, not, not, certainly not in SA. Um, where we have a massive opportunity is, is about uh, the, the playing on the strength of the state uh, in bringing in international students. Um, as a state, we're probably below the national average. The national average is about 21% of the population of students would be in uh, international. 
and, and we're low. Now, I mean, as a state, we've doubled it, more than doubled it in 10 years, but we still have a ways to go on that. And, and think about all the economic flow that comes from that in bringing in international students, their families who visit, the actual perceptions of the state, those who settle. Um, there's a visa issue. I mean, if you graduate uh, and you're an international student and you've got a, a bachelor's, you've got a two-year work horizon. Do we want people to leave after two years after they've contributed? We need to, we need to really have that conversation. Um, we could probably move from sharing the wealth among 23 million to maybe 25 million or 26 million, and we still have quite a lot of resource to go around. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's probably a need for a, a larger strategy around what that means for us. Um, the diversification of the student body is a good thing because it brings in perspective and expertise. Um, but the interstate piece will be an economic attribute piece as it relates to the institution. And that's a body of work that I have to do, Michael has to do, and Martin has to do. We actually want to delve into the international situation just mm -hmm. a little later, but uh, if I can turn to you, Joanne, um, looking at Santos's experience as uh, a national uh, company headquartered here in Adelaide, competing in a pretty fierce marketplace up against the likes of Chevron and Shell, BP. Um, how does Santos go about attracting talent from interstate to come and work in South Australia? Yeah, it's a good question and um, it's, it is a challenge, but it's a challenge getting people to move anyway. I think Australia has a different sort of culture around that. We talk about people thinking that they need to go offshore but if you go to the US experience, it's quite common to actually move around that country. It's harder to get people to move um, in Australia. It's even harder to get them to move to a smaller state, if, if, if you're looking at a, a Sydney versus an Adelaide, for instance. But um, I'd, I'm really pleased to say we've had lots of success at it as well. And I think it's about um, uh, companies focusing in on the culture, uh, leveraging the benefits that exist in whichever area that they're operating in, making sure people know about that, making sure that um, as an employer you develop a reputation for treating people well, making sure that there's collaborative environments. That's the sort of environment, as Bernard was saying, that people want to work in these days. So we focus a lot on that and we've doubled our workforce size in the last five years to meet our LNG challenges. So uh, and we've pretty much done that ourselves because that's, that's been our key enabler to be able to de deliver our projects. And uh, you've actually touched on a, a really important point there and it was sort of brought up by hands uh, uh, at the introduction. The, the, the concept of perception, the concept that this is the place to come mm -hmm. and live and, and uh, develop your career. Um, I certainly know, being relatively new to the state myself, that. Uh, it was no small factor when someone pointed out that it didn't matter where I camped in Adelaide, I'd be only an hour's drive away from 300 of the best seller doors on the planet. Yes. There are perceptions of lifestyle that are very favourable to this state. Um, but I would have to say that they're not widely held across the country. A lot of people don't appreciate exactly what we, we have on offer. Bernard, would you say that's fair? I, I think it is fair. And, um, uh, as, you know, I'm a proud patriotic Australian. But as much as I hold that view, I also think we are quite a colonial country still. And the colonial country means that we see urban sophistication as Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra. That's it. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in, in Western Australia. Um, the, the, the net migration to Western Australia... Uh, it, uh, no more than 10% in total migration to Western Australia comes from across the Nullarbor Plain. Perth is more likely to get people from London to go to Perth than from Melbourne or Sydney to go to Perth. It's, it's 90%, 10%. I've likened the Nullarbor Plain to the Berlin Wall. It stops people from the east getting into the west. <laughs> I'd actually shift the Berlin Wall from the Nullarbor to probably Mount Gambia through to Broken Hill. There is a reticence by the eastern seaboard to actually move west, um, which I think is a very real. It's, it's, and it's, it, I don't know whether it's a, it's a sort of colonial hangover and this point about going from a four and a half million city like Sydney, which is a true global city and sees itself as a true global city, to a city like Adelaide. And I think that's, that's the cultural shift that we need to... Whereas in, um, in the UK or France, for example, 
apparently the most uh, aspirational place in France to live is Aix-en-Provence. Uh, it's 100,000 people. Paris has 8 million people. The French don't have a problem with it. Uh, the Brits, you know, maybe they don't want to go to Yorkshire or whatever it is, but, uh, but in, in Europe there is a sophistication about moving to the provinces, if you like. That is not the case in Australia. We see urban sophistication, metropolitan sophistication, global sophistication coming out of our strongest capital city. If you go to Sydney, I'm a Melbourneian, but 25 years you turn up to Sydney and they'll say, when are you moving to Sydney, Bernard? Uh, if you came to Sydney, uh, then you wouldn't be able to afford a phone box in the eastern suburbs. They use their real estate as a cultural weapon to belt you into place. It's a priority. It's a, it's a pecking order, if you like. We need to challenge that in Australia. We need to change it uh, as a nation. Um, so, yes, I do see that this, this reticence to move around the country is very, di it's very difficult to move in the other direction. Uh, moving from Adelaide to Sydney uh, is, is a much more uh, established uh, pattern. And, in fact, again, if you move around business circles in Sydney, you find very quickly that, you know, um, a, a lot of people actually come from Adelaide uh, and I call them the Adelaide Mafia, because <laughs> they all know each other. Uh, you're from Adelaide, and they say, look, we're in the metropolitan, we're in the big city, we're in New York, almost. And they, they it's very strong networks. Uh, and some of them do come back, uh, but it's this, it's this one-way street leading to a global city that I think is quite a colonial view. And I think we need to challenge that as Australians. David, you are a, a fellow newcomer to this state, um, what was your perception of South Australia prior to coming here? Yeah. Uh, and how did that affect your decision on a personal level as a place to bring up the kids and mm -hmm. that? W what was your perception? Um, a, a bit like you, actually. I knew South Australia through the bottle shop. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, you know, before I met Wolf Flap, I just thought he was a label. Um, um, <laughs> so. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I knew Adelaide. I actually knew Adelaide from the Grand Prix as a kid, right? So I remember that, and I was I was into a bit of a petrol head, so I, I liked that racing piece, and I associated Adelaide with racing. Um, wine was obviously very evident, but when you you know when we were making a decision, uh, and my children were aged six and eight when we moved, um, we looked very very carefully at the, at the, the the environment we were moving to, and and like you, you know, it's it's a safe city. Um, it's an easy city to get around. If I compare my commute in Dublin, which is probably the same distance the commute I have here, it was an hour and a quarter longer than the one I have here. Um, and um, and I didn't, the sun didn't shine, right? There's, you know, there's, there's all of these kind of intangible, um, the soft pieces around Adelaide. But the, um, the real piece for me was one where, um, given the size and given my experience, I mean, Dublin and, and Adelaide are not dissimilar cities in terms of population. Given the size of Adelaide, given the structure of a federal government where you have federation and state, um, it was clear to me that an institution like the UniSA could actually have influence on a state level. Um, and it was also clear to me that, we, you know, we, we visited Sydney. Sydney's nice to go on holiday to. Uh, that was my, my, my conclusion. It's, it's, uh, it's a different pace of life to life, life in Adelaide. And if you want to unpick Bernard's points, I suppose, around the costs on the eastern seaboard, that has to spill over into the cost of business. That has to, uh, you know, there has to be a leverage piece here that we can use. And, and, and it has been used. I mean, Hewlett Packard have made that statement in, in, in bringing the new jobs that they're bringing to the state around the cost of doing business. The fact that it's easy to get accommodation, the fact that you don't have to have a, sh a shoebox uh, at a cost of $2 million to live in. Schools are good, the education system is good, and it's a safe city. So it had a, all those tick boxes for me as somebody looking from the far side of the planet. And I think that extends out to a lot of individuals who've moved. I mean, you know, UniSA has, we're ranked number one in the world, if you look at the world rankings, for the internationalization of our staff. Right? There's staff from 80 countries on, 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 uh, on, on the books. Um, I think internationally, Adelaide marketing itself internationally as a venue where you, could, where you can live well, access um, a, a good lifestyle, and, and, and do, you know, prosper as a, as a person um, without fear. And my children went out to play on the street with the neighbors. That wasn't done in Ireland. Um, and and it, you, it was maybe a generation ago when I grew up. But the transition from free and easy uh, and, uh, lifestyle for kids to, to uh, more of a nanny state had happened in, that, in the last 20 years. And it's, it's not there, it's not here. So I find that um, endearing. Um, connectivity is really important. And one of the real strengths here is that everybody knows everybody. So you have to be careful what you say. But, um, <laughs> 
But the reality is getting things done and the networking piece is there. And if, if I look at innovation and entrepreneurship and networking is at the center of it. It's, it's about how people relate to each other in conversations, picking up the phone and having an endpoint. Um, so all of that, I suppose, milieu comes together to, 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 to be an enticing place. Um, and you know, the fact that it was 42 degrees hotter uh, on the day I arrived than the, the place I left was, uh, <laughs> was, just, was just a bonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do now actually relish uh, gloating to my former colleagues in, in Sydney that uh, I now live in the bush, surrounded by trees, mm. so much so that two or three nights a week I'm awoken by rutting koalas, <laughs> and I still have a 20-minute drive to my job in yep. the centre of the city. Yep. There's nowhere else in the country, therefore nowhere else in the world you can do that, particularly with respect to the koalas. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, the, it, it's small, almost intangible things like that mm. which contribute heavily to the perception. So uh, how important do you think, Joanne, is it particularly for international uh, skilled uh, migrants coming to Australia. How important is it that we sell the perception of this isn't just a great place to do business, it's a great place to live? Look, I think it's very important and, um, and it's something that um, if, you, if you're in the northern hemisphere in the middle of their winter advertising sunshine and um, quality of lifestyle, you're going to get people's attention. <laughs> Um, I don't think it's everything, though. Uh, I think that um, what, if we're going to be moving people from one, um, one country to another, uh, they're often bringing families and, um, and are looking not just for um, uplifting for the next two years, they're making a conscious decision. And they want to know that there are other industries, that they're not just going to be tied to one employer that there are actually options. So creating great growth um, amongst industries is, is almost as important as being able to attract them and keep them once they get here so that they actually see those opportunities. And I think you're right, when, when they actually do arrive here, and there's been lots of business uh, examples um, in, in um, South Australia where this is the case, uh, Sage Automation started up here, we've got Maine Farmer doing some great things, um, and expanding in the US. The Nova um, radio network started up here. And if you talk to any of those executives, they all say it was easier to start up here. It uh, cost less. There was a ready pool of labor. Um, we wanted to grow nationally. We can do that easily from, from Adelaide. So they're the other things that I think we can leverage as well. I think also as an organization, uh, RIOS, we've found um, it, it, it's in some, most of the sense uh, a historical artefact that we set up in Adelaide. Uh, but we found that as a national organisation, Adelaide's a terrific place to set yourself up at our size because it means that we have to work that little bit harder to get national recognition. Mm -hmm. But that uh, national recognition is easier to achieve from the, from the perspective of we can actually operate at a higher level here. You know, um, uh, uh, we're currently a 19.6 full-time equivalent organisation. Um, that operates at a higher level with a higher profile in a city like Adelaide than it does in New South Wales where it would be lost or, or Melbourne where it would be lost. So, uh, look, we, you, you touched on the, the logical next step in the conversation is, OK, so we've identified that we can attract um, people to South Australia, skilled migration in, uh, in not just from other states but internationally. Um, we can think of mechanisms in order to maintain uh, ho our homegrown talent. Once they're here, how do we keep them here? Bernard, is it all about providing the opportunities and, and the career uh, 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 opportunities for career advancement? Uh, or do we actually sell more of the intangibles, such as the perception of a great place to be? I, I think that it, there's, a, there's an, an equation that people go through. Yes, there's a, uh, they want uh, depth and range of, and options in job opportunities. They want that um, 
um, configured against the cost of housing, the quality of um, uh, the length of time that you're commuting. So it's almost a triangulation. So it's the commuting, the house, the house cost, the quality of urban environment or rural environment versus the, the scale, range and depth of jobs, if you like. Uh, so in actual fact, I think on, on two of those, um, Adelaide, South Australia absolutely blitzes almost anywhere else in the country in terms of what you can buy for your money. Uh, in, in Adelaide and the length of the commute, absolutely. Uh, so it's the depth range uh, of jobs on offer. And that's where I think uh, South Australia and Australia more generally needs to uh, focus on the skill sets of the future, which is going to be in education, professional services, health, engineering services. Um, I would also see a uh, future here in terms of uh, defence issues. Um, there's a strong uh, history of defence research here. Uh, I can see that uh, that is going to become a bigger industry. Uh, even space uh, research I would like to see coming out of uh, South Australia. I think you can build on that. Um, so uh, it, it's actually a, a triangulation argument where the, the, the third link, the third area needs to be developed uh, and invested in through the universities uh, with government help, uh, of course. Uh, and the model, I think, is not necessarily to look to interstate migration. Yes, you will get the, you know, some Adelaideans coming back from Sydney and the odd person coming across to a job in, uh, in Santos. But I think the evidence from Western Australia is very clear. We ain't going to change the colonial view of the East Coast uh, if you wish to grow this state in a significant way, uh, in my view, uh, do what the West Australians do and, and recruit uh, forget the eastern seaboard and focus on attracting bright, young, energetic talent from overseas that want to invest their 20s, their 30s, their 40s in my state and make a go of it. To me, that's the sort of person I would want in my state. And Joanne Santos has done an incredible job, as you uh, alluded to earlier, of attracting uh, and expanding a skilled workforce. Um, now you've got them here, how do you keep them here? Well, you've got to treat them right, of course. <laughs> so culture is important. We work on that a lot, um, providing opportunities for development. But that's not always easy because um, that requires growth as well. And so I think companies, um, and, and I guess Santos has been in the fortunate position to have the right sort of investment partners, but companies do need to look broader than um, their own backyard. They need to look at... Um, other opportunities in order to keep their, their staff as well. I can assure you that um, if you talk to anybody who was working with Santos, say, seven or eight years ago, they would not have envisaged that we would be about to deliver on about 9% of Malaysia's energy needs and about 11% of Korea's energy needs through our projects. That in itself has, has retained people and attracted people as well. So. Thinking bigger is, is part of the equation as well, I think. And uh, just to wind up, before we go to questions from the audience, uh, David, something that's struck me as uh, an attraction to this state and the, the reason to stay here is that we operate in a very collaborative manner. Mm. Uh, I've seen the three universities come together for any number of events, uh, Today, you're on stage from the University of South Australia, an event supported by Flinders University. You know, that, that, that sense of collaboration that we see in the universities, I mean, the only other time I ever saw the University of New South Wales and the University of Sydney come together was for a football match. <laughs> um, but that also extends into business. There is a, a, a genuine air here of, if you come to South Australia, you can stick around. It may not be with us who've attracted you here, but there is opportunities across your sector, across your industry. Uh, yeah. am, I, am I making that up, or is that also a perception that you would um, have? I think there's a certain stickiness about the state. Uh, the state. Um, I, Ray Spencer talks about it as the Hotel California, you can never leave. You know? <laughs> um, um, but you know, your point is well made. Uh, Michael and I, uh, and Warren Bradmington, uh, and, and Jeff Gunningham from, from TAFE yesterday, the four of us, um, all signed up all of our institutions collectively to races and stops at me. 
And it was a conversation uh, where Anne Gale, the, the Equal uh, Rights Commissioner, called me and asked me, was the NESA interested in it? And I said, not only am I interested in it, but I know the other guys will be as well. And we moved within the space of a week to saying, yes, we'll do this. And that's unparalleled, I think, in terms of the ease with which we actually communicate. There's, there's, a, co there's a competitive tension because we, we, we have a certain amount of, of uh, you know, uh, space that we try to occupy and, and markets we try to service. But the collaboration is there. Um, it's all over the place. We, we go down in Tonsley together. We do things from the health precinct. Sam is owned by the institutions and, and the state to collectively. So I do find that that, that collaborative intent is, is, is it's an easy door to open. Um, the industry engagement piece between the universities and the, and, and the industry is a, a space where, um, to be honest, the conversations we have here in the state, I heard them in 2008 in Europe. Uh, every economic crisis brings around the same issues around how are we going to get businesses and universities to work together. Uh, I, on some level, there's a kind of a, a misperception that um, there's a big bucket of intellectual property that's waiting to be capitalized inside the doors of the institutions and that we're sitting on us like dragons on gold. Um, that's not the case. Uh, but th there are skills to be unlocked. And uh, the, the, the porosity of the institutions into the business community become really important. And then the traffic between the business community and, and, and the universities becomes important. So the stickiness of the state is there because it's a good place to live. The ability to network in the state is there because uh, it is, it's a small, connected place. And those two things are, are great strengths. So I think that's a, that's a, a real boon to us. Well, I could, perhaps I could just add or, or, or build on that, um, this idea of collaboration. There is a cultural p peculiarity coming out of the census that, is, that, is, um, uh, that relates to Adelaide, South Australia. And there's a question on the census that is asked, uh, did you volunteer over the last 12 months? 20% of the Australian population said they did uh, over the age of 18. But if you go to the wheat belt communities of uh, the northern part of um, South Australia, uh, places like Jamestown, for example, stand out. 50% uh, of the population say they will volunteer. And you find that right throughout South Australia, there is a greater pro, uh, predisposition to volunteer in this state. And the places that are least likely to say that they have volunteered come out of Sydney. The more corporate, the more intense, the more Manhattan-esque, I'm in there to survive. I ain't got time for anyone else. I am actually, you come to South Australia and it's a more socially cohesive community. Everyone's volunteering. The time you're most likely to volunteer in life is between 60 and 69. And so if you have a high proportion of the population in their 60s, then they're looking for volunteering, opportunity to invest back into the community. So you can call it collaboration in a corporate sense, or in a civic mindedness, you can call it a social <coughs> cohesion. I think there is a, a, a natural trait here and a, uh, and a strategic advantage of volunteering. How can we harness that predisposition, that goodwill, if you like, to our advantage in terms of building skills, building social um, or galvanising the community behind a particular view? I think that it's a sell point uh, of South Australia and particularly of uh, Adelaide and the regions as well.